Just as the entire city was on the verge of being captured, Ganicus, in order to buy more time for retreat, voluntarily offered to stall the enemy forces. This is not request. Shortly after the slave army safely evacuated, Crassus, leading the Roman legions, seized control of the city and gradually eliminated the rebels within. Gannicus could only hide with his sibyl in a concealed compartment beneath the stable floor. However, this place was not safe, and Roman soldiers immediately launched a thorough search, leaving no stone unturned, exploring every corner. More soldiers return. They pry wood and beam searching for vermin. Before long, a soldier noticed something unusual and bent down. <laughs> if any but my visage return, take your life. Will be a kindness in comparison to what they would do to you. Having made all the necessary arrangements, Gannicus approached them directly, engaging in a fierce fight. Only sounds of the struggle could be heard from above, causing the Sybil to anxiously raise her head. At that moment, she felt both terrified and hopeful. In an instant, a bloodstained sword pierced through the floor, and warm blood dripped onto her face. The Sybil was overwhelmed with fear, slowly placing a dagger against her neck, preparing to end her own life. The two of them stealthily climbed onto the rooftop to gather information on the situation. They discovered every corner filled with Roman soldiers on guard duty and patrolling. Under such circumstances, there seemed to be no way for them to escape the city. Just as the two of them were contemplating their next move, they suddenly noticed the pirate leader passing by, holding Leda captive. The pirate leader expressed his fondness for the gift before departing. Gannicus quietly followed them, and soon Leda was brought into a small room by the pirate leader. He confessed that he had admired her for a long time, and that he would take her out to sea, making her the noble queen of pirates. <laughs> Disregarding Leda's resistance, he left his distinctive mark on her wrist. From then on, the noble Leda descended from being a lady to becoming a pirate servant. The pirate leader shamelessly asserted his dominance. Just then, Gannicus rushed in fearlessly, and the haters met. Without giving him a chance to speak, he immediately engaged in a fierce fight with the pirate leader. As the undefeated gods of gladiators, the pirates couldn't resist for more than a few moments before they were completely defeated. Just then, the pirate leader grabs Sybil as a shield. He threatens Gannicus that he's going to kill Sybil, but doesn't notice Leda coming up behind him. Gannicus quickly confronted the pirate leader, obtaining a cloak and a pass, preparing to leave. Being kind-hearted, his Sybil couldn't bear to let Leda wait for death alone. Gannicus believed that since Leda was a Roman, if they left together, they would soon be discovered. I stand nothing but a slave, as you once did. With a sense of righteousness, Gannicus had no choice but to disguise himself as the pirate leader. His plan was to secretly leave the city with the two women during the Roman soldiers' celebration. As they neared the city gate, they noticed two spare horses by the roadside. They prepared to mount the horses and escape the city. Unfortunately, they encountered Caesar, who had just participated in a massacre. Caesar sensed something amiss upon seeing two women and immediately became suspicious. Granted but one woman. Realizing that his disguise was no longer viable, Gannicus turned around and engaged in combat. Caesar was no match for Gannicus and was directly wounded in the waist by his blade. More and more Roman soldiers swarmed towards them. Gannicus swiftly turned and kicked over a nearby bonfire, blocking the soldiers' encirclement. He jumped on the horse and dashed towards the city gate with his sibyl. Upon reaching the city gate, a group of Roman soldiers were already in formation. Without hesitation, Gannicus rushed towards the crowd. He didn't care about anything at this moment and started a frenzy of killing against the group of soldiers. Leda, who had no martial skills, was pierced by a spear, and Gannicus immediately came to her rescue. Bent over in pain, Leda struggled to escape towards the outskirts of the city. At this moment, Gannicus had a contemptuous expression as he looked at Caesar, who was catching up. He threw away the token that was the symbol of supreme power in the eyes of the Romans. Turning around, he left elegantly with his sibyl. At this point, Caesar was so angry that he returned to his command post in the city. Caesar expressed his dissatisfaction to Crassus. Why don't we pursue the slave army immediately? Do I have to risk my life and personally kill every traitor? Calm and composed, Crassus showed no signs of impatience. Everything is under control, and everything is going according to our plan. At sunrise tomorrow, 
our army will round up the rebels. But at the moment, it's cold and windy on Melia Ridge. Spartacus' slave army gathered around a bonfire, discussing countermeasures. At present, everyone was suffering from severe material shortages. If this continues, we will all die here. Just when a few key members didn't know how to respond, Gannicus arrived with Leda and Sybil. Everyone saw Gannicus returning and scathed, and the brothers were very happy. Leda, who was severely injured, was now in critical condition. Spartacus took her down from the horse and immediately arranged for a medical team to treat her. Then Spartacus and Gannicus went to the mountain to analyze the current situation. It was only then that they finally understood why Crassus didn't immediately pursue them. There was not a blade of grass on the snowy mountain, and a trench several tens of kilometers long appeared ahead. On both sides were sheer cliffs and mountains. This meant that Crassus' army of 10,000 men would definitely attack our rear. Once the large army arrives, our rebellion will be doomed. However, a living person turned into an ice sculpture in the blizzard just a few hours ago. A few slaves were praying around a pile of stones on the top of the snowy mountain, lighting candles and praying incessantly. The devout Sybil even cut her finger and dripped blood on the wooden carving as an offering to the gods. Their only purpose was to hope for the gods' response and to end the blizzard as soon as possible. Spartacus was saddened by this scene and helplessly turned away. He kept repeating in his heart that he must lead the army of tens of thousands of slaves out of Crassus' siege no matter what. Just the day before, the slave army had tried several times to break through the walls built by the Roman soldiers above the trench. However, their every move was exposed to the Roman soldiers on the high walls. As soon as someone attempted to climb over the wall, the soldiers would effortlessly shoot them down with a spear. After a few days, the foot of the mountain was filled with the bodies of the rebels. Crixus looked at the corpses on the ground and roared in anger. He directly suggested to Spartacus to face the Roman army head-on with the gladiators. Spartacus directly rejected Crixus' foolish and ignorant idea. At this time, the Roman army was well-equipped, numerous in numbers, and had favorable terrain. Most of us who are unable to eat enough and lack proper clothing are slaves, with weak fighting abilities. Engaging in a direct confrontation is undoubtedly like a moth flying into the flame, ultimately leading to death. At this moment, Crassus's legion of 10,000 soldiers has arrived at Spartacus's rear and is fully prepared for battle. Each of them is well-equipped and filled with confidence. However, when the two armies come face to face, they halt their attack and set up camp, waiting only for Crassus's command. At the command post in Sinuessa, Crassus and his son Tiberius are engaged in heartfelt conversation. Crassus is very pleased with Tiberius's recent actions. So as a reward, Crassus directly returns Tiberius's armor to him and reinstates him to his former position as his right-hand man, facilitating their future collaboration side by side. Tiberius is extremely satisfied with this. Tiberius approaches Kore, his father's lover, stating that he now holds an official position, and he is no longer the boy he used to be. After defeating the rebellion of Spartacus, he intends to settle permanently in Sinuessa, to safeguard this fertile land for his father. And you will also stay in Sinuessa, taking care of my daily life. Upon hearing this, Kore's face instantly darkens. A woman can never forgive a man who has violated her. So she goes to Crassus's tent to confirm the truth, only to find out that Tiberius was not lying. So she was ready to tell him all about the insults Tiberius had forced upon her. Just as she is about to speak, one of Crassus's subordinates approaches the tent to report the situation. Crassus orders Kore to return to the city first, and they will discuss the details once he returns victorious. In front of the two armies, Crassus sets up a command post and a viewing platform. The purpose is to send a message to the slave army across the field. In the eyes of the Roman soldiers, you rebel forces are merely fighting for your lives. Entertaining us, much like the gladiatorial arena. Crixus, facing Crassus's arrogant arrogance, erupts in anger. He once again expresses his determination to lead the gladiators and the Roman army into a fight to the death. Spartacus remains clear-headed and calm, pointing out that Crassus currently holds an absolute advantage and is overly confident. He dares to establish his camp at the forefront of the army. Isn't this a perfect opportunity for us to assassinate him? After discussions among the leadership team, they decide to bring only a few exceptional experts and seize Crassus's head during the stormy night. As night falls, a blizzard rages outside the camp, with visibility less than 5 meters. Spartacus and a few others quietly approach Crassus's military camp. Quickly and effortlessly slaying several soldiers, they enter Crassus's tent. To everyone's surprise, Crassus is not present. 
In the center of the tent, on a cross, the bodies of their companions were bound, and inscriptions were carved on their chests. They realize they have fallen into an ambush and hastily escape the tent. But it is too late. A large number of fully armed soldiers have been waiting outside the tent. With no retreat available, the group is forced to engage in direct combat. Each one of them is a very powerful fighter. Fearless, they fight against the well-equipped soldiers. Unfortunately, Naivia, who was a slightly weaker fighter, was hit and wounded. Just as Naivia is about to be killed, Spartacus saves her just in time. He quickly carries the injured Naivia and urges everyone to retreat. Upon hearing arrogant remarks from behind, Crixus can no longer tolerate it. Immediately he stopped, turned, and rushed at the Roman soldiers alone, frantically hacking at them. Witnessing harm done to his woman, Crixus's fighting ability instantly erupts. In the blink of an eye, the arrogant Roman soldiers fall one by one. At that moment, reinforcements from the Roman army arrive from the rear. Spartacus shouts for Crixus to retreat, and everyone manages to escape from danger.